I am really pleased and excited to have Judith here today at Google for our talk. Dr. Judith Wright is hailed as a peerless educator, world-class coach, lifestyles expert, inspirational speaker, best-selling author, and corporate consultant. She's called one of America's ultimate experts by Women's World Magazine. And Judith has appeared in over 500 radio stations. I didn't even know there was 500 radio stations. <laughs> and 80 television shows. I didn't, well, maybe there's 80 television shows. Including ABC, uh, ABC's 2020, Oprah, The Today Show, and Good Morning America. Dr. Wright is the co-founder of the Foundation for Transformational Leadership, the Wright Graduate Institute offering master and doctoral degrees and certificates in transformational leadership and coaching. Uh, she, is, she also founded SOFIA, the Society of Femininity in Action. So today, we're really excited because Dr. Wright is going to share with us her cutting edge research in the science behind creating a spectacular life and how to get rid of the mindless habits that get in the way of our mindfulness and living a richer, fuller life. So please welcome Dr. Judith Wright. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks. Thanks to all of you. Uh, thanks for having me, and that we can have this kind of mindful mindlessness. We're going to be more mindful about our mindlessness. And how, how many of you could admit that perhaps you've had a mindless moment somewhere in your life? Could I see that? All right, I want to check. How many of you are so out of it right now you can't raise your hand? I just got to see. All right, we want to play with that. So, there's, so how many of you could have been doing something else right now? Well, obviously you could. So, and, and you chose to be here. So and I also want to find out, do you participate? Can we do this together? All right, great. Well, three of you said, uh-huh, yeah. so we're okay. <laughs> we'll play with that. All right, great. Because what I would be working with, I want to find out what do you yearn for? That's going to be a bigger term that we're going to be working with and how this relates to mindfulness and overcoming our mindless habits. But I'm going to ask you some questions, and if, they, if it feels like something that matters to you or that you yearn for, if you'd raise your hand. How many of you would really like even more consciousness, more mindfulness? Can I see that? Okay, great. How about just some real basic stuff of life? How about more time? Who'd like more time? All right, great, perfect. How about more money? Let's just go at it that way. <laughs> but the rest of you have too much? We can trade a little. We can mix it up a little bit. How about more energy? Can I see that? How many of you don't have the energy to raise your hand right now? Is that part of it? All right, these are all related to what we're going to talk about. How about, I think this means something, meaning, fulfillment, satisfaction, having your days even more meaningful than they might be now. All right, good. How about more... Satisfying relationships, more intimacy. Who's interested in that? The rest of you just had a bad relationship? Are we like <laughs> going somewhere else? All right, great. Just want to check. Um, how about dealing with stress better? Who's in, who'd like that? All right, good. This helps me. Um, how about who'd like a better memory? Who can't remember what I just asked you? <laughs> All right, this is related. Then also, how about more learning faster, remembering things more, having more critical thinking, have your cognition be even better than it is now? All right, good. How many of you are interested in a deeper spiritual relationship or spirituality? Okay. How about, um, how many of you like to maximize your IQ? All right, good. <laughs> These are all really and this one's kind of generic, but how many of you would like an even richer, deeper, fuller quality of life? Okay. And how about just more happiness? Can you see that? All right. I know there's a related, but there's a specific reason I'm mentioning all these different things I'm talking about. How about, I think this is something that many of us are in for, to realize our potential, become who we could become, live this life really, really well. Who's interested in that? All right, great. We, we um, talk about that at right as the life project. How are we going to, we go about our work projects and our home projects, but taking on our life project. So how many of you would like a well-lived life project that gets a really good grade or however it works <laughs> when you turn it in? All right, good. Yeah, right. So a couple of, all these things I just mentioned, they're very common kinds of things, but they're all very related to what we're talking about today. And the research shows that these are the things that are impacted by the kinds of things we're going to be talking about today. And the more we get more skill with this, the more all those results happen in our life. And the less skill we have, all of those things are impacted. That's how important it is what we're talking about. And obviously you're here because you want something and we're going to learn to grow together. So part of where I'm going to be coming from, I've been spending 35 years doing, studying great lives. I was really interested in, I grew up in a factory town, so it was an interesting kind of thing to see how people chose to live their lives. So 
I was really interested, who lives a better life? Who lives a great life? Who fulfills their potential? How do you do this? What is that? So I've been studying it for a long time, and it's part of my research, it's part of my doctoral dissertation, and I really wanted to know who really maximizes their potential? What do they do differently? What is that? And it's led me on this kind of amazing journey over all this time, not just doing research, but developing curriculum, testing things out with thousands and thousands of people, developing ways to help people learn life skills to be able to get the best out of their careers, their personal lives, their spirituality, their relationships, their family life. And over all this time, there's some things that started to become very clear to me, plus looking at my own life as I was on this journey. And what I found is that consciousness and mindfulness and social-emotional intelligence is obviously part of this, as I'm sure many of you know, and I've been working with that. But what I've been finding is that there were some surprises for me, because what I thought was a formula for a great life is not exactly what the research showed. And that's what we're going to be looking at today, and how it relates to our mindfulness, and how our mindlessness subtracts from that. So how many of you are meditators? Can I see that? All right, great. How many of you consider yourself on a spiritual path of some sort? How about just professional development, learning, growing, personal development? Okay, great. All, all the above? <laughs> There's a few of us. All right. All of those things that you're doing are really critical and very important in terms of quality of life and productivity and all those results we talked about. However, these soft addictions, mindlessness, these places where we go a bit unconscious, really take away from, the, it counterproductive to some of our mindful practices. So we want to work with that. And also what we're looking at and what our research shows is how to be more mindful moment to moment, day to day, in interactions, with every work project we're doing, with the people we're working with. How do we bring a degree of all of this things that matters to us in every single moment of every day, rather than having kind of a driven life with a moment of meditation. How many of you can relate to that? Kind of like you're sneaking it in sometimes. All right, we want to work on how to have that be more available to you all the time. So what the big issue here is this term that I coined over 20 years ago, soft addictions. And they are where we go mindless. Every single one of us does it. In fact, a recent poll, 91% of Americans admitted to having soft addictions. I think the other 9% are in denial because I don't know anybody that doesn't have moments of mindlessness. And you'll find it just during the time we're talking. So how many of you have already checked out several times while we're talking? You're checking your smartphone, your, you know, whatever. Yeah, that's, I'm not saying it has to be a soft addiction, but we go back and forth this way. And I'm, I must say, just to say this, full disclosure, I'm not anti-technology. I love technology. It's a relationship with it that we're talking about today. So soft addictions are those seemingly harmless habits, like overeating, over shopping, watching too much TV, checking your Facebook page a zillion times during the day, checking your email compulsively. But overdoing anything, overdoing any normal everyday activity beyond its usefulness for some other purposes, and it has a lot more cost than we're aware of. It takes time, obviously, so oftentimes costs money, but it mutes our consciousness. That's how it goes to anti-mindfulness. It numbs our feelings. It reduces our social-emotional intelligence, and it robs us of a lot of energy and motivation. So we're going to work with this a little bit and then look underneath the neuroscience of that and how human beings are so predisposed to these kinds of habits and what we can do about it. But rather than my talk about them, we're going to show a little video clip from some interviews that I've done. But see if you can recognize yourself and also watch if you're saying, oh, I'm not that bad because that's a clue too. So let's look at this for a sec. They're just lists of things. It doesn't mean these things are a problem, but are you overdoing them sometimes? If any, do they get you get kind of high or buzzed or forgetful or kind of numb when you're doing it? Do people tease you about it? Have you thought like, well, I'm kind of overdoing that? Those kinds of things let us know that these things might be a little bit of an issue. So I'm going to go through these categories really quickly, then I'm going to have you go through this checklist and see what you think might be susceptible things for you so we can have not just uh, be more engaged. And if you need any of the handouts, let it just raise your hand. We'll make sure you get those. Okay, great. We'll pass a few more out. Um, so there's four categories of soft addictions as I've been <laughs> studying this. There's activities, the things that you do too much of. And, and can you shout some things out? Not you, but your friends or other people in the world. What, like, what do they do? What are some of the things we overdo? Email. Email. What else? She's on hers right now as she's saying that. TV, you know, like, <laughs> she's taking notes, it's fair. So all kinds of things. It can be anything that we overdo. So activities, they can be media, they can be engaging activities, things that we do. So activities can become a soft addiction. There's another category which is interesting. It's not doing activities, procrastinating. How many of you are guilty of procrastinating? 
And, and you know how we best procrastinate? We use other soft addictions to do that. And we disappear for a while to do this. So procrastinating, not, getting, not doing the things we wish we had done or not getting around to things, that kind of thing. There's a third category that's moods and ways of being. This one was interesting to me because you can get kind of addicted to ways of being. How many of you know like really just perpetually cranky people? They're just like, and they're, it's like a habit. It's like it's a reflex or, or habitually smiley Pollyanna types you can sometimes run into or sarcastic, not like there's, has to be wrong, but there's a, it's a, like a reflexive, anytime something gets uncomfortable, somebody responds with this kind of mood or way of being. And now they're finding there's a neurochemical wash that goes on with these moods that we get addicted to as those moods come up. And if we're not feeling that, we think a thought that triggers that, that same neurochemical wash that brings that mood back is fascinating. So moods and ways of being can be also soft addictions. And the final thing is related to activities. It's just things, consumable, edible kinds of things. And it can be your favorite chocolate or collections that you have. I was doing a, a, a talk, and a woman said, oh, I think I have a thing addiction. I said, well, most of us do. What, what is that? She said, well, it's a food. It's a food group. And I said, what is that? She said, it's the Ito food group. And I said, what is that? I thought it was like Asian fusion or something. She said, no, Cheeto, Frito, Dorito. I said, oh, yeah, I got it. Now I understand. So maybe that's something of yours as well. So take just a moment or two and take that checklist. Mark, anything you think might be, you might be susceptible to. So that we're all in here as human beings working on this together. You, oh yeah, there should be blanks on there. So because any, anything overdone can even great stuff. Playing chess can become a soft addiction. One woman told me she volunteered too much, and she really did. She was volunteering every day and wasn't getting on with sending her resume out, getting new job things she needed to do. So even playing, practicing an instrument can become a soft addiction if you're overusing it to avoid some other kinds of activities. So add anything that you might be susceptible to. All right. Well, let me find out. How many of you had more in the activities column, more stuff you overdo? Can I see that? How many, okay. How many of you more in the avoidances, things you don't do, the procrastination, not getting around to things? How about the mood addictions? Anybody find those for yourself, mood or way of being addictions? Okay. How about just plain old stuff, whether it's chocolate or collections or whatever in that way? Okay, great. The rest of you don't have soft addictions? I'm running too much. Or you're still, still working on it? Because I just want you to see, and I'm not saying these necessarily are, it's our relationship with these things. And partly really want us to look at it. We're going to understand the addictive nature of human beings and what to do to unlock this so that all of the practices that we're doing, our mindful practices, our yoga that we do, our thoughtfulness, our critical thinking, all the capacities we have are maximized rather than compromised. So that's why I want you to be looking at that. I can tell you some of mine, and I've been working with them, but for me it was nail biting and catalogs. I would just disappear. I would open a catalog and it was like I was in a dreamland for a period of time. It was just like lots of time would go by. Um, and I'm a reader, and a lot of times I'm reading for stimulation, and intellectual development, all kinds of things, or research, but there's a lot of times I'm reading it like it's just uh, to disappear and just go mindless for a period of time, depending on the reading material that I have. So if I can tell you mine, you can tell me yours. So anybody willing to share, just shout a few things out, you might have a soft addiction? Diet soda. Diet soda. Oh, that's a really popular <laughs> one. It's great, great, thanks. What else? Wikipedia. Wikipedia is great. What else? Is, uh, how many of you? Um, how many of you have food addictions like chocolate or salty, crunchy things or whatever? I know. So that's a very common one as well. So I just want you in the game with this because if you've got a one or two you're thinking about, you're going to personalize what we're talking about a little bit more and see what this is. This isn't about. And we're going to find out the wisdom that our soft addictions have. There's a beautiful messages and there's a really interesting information in them. So we're going to learn to translate those by the end of the talk today to find out what are they trying to tell us? Why are we doing that? What's, what's trying to get our attention? And what's the neuroscience underneath that that we can pay attention to that and shift it? But lest you think this is just a phenomenon of modern times, it's not. Because many people tell me that, oh, it's just te technology. That's why I'm so addicted. No. The ancient Greeks were dealing with something very, very similar. Whether we're talking about they t the Greek word is akrasia. And I think it makes you crazier because it's crazy. It's like it's doing things that you know just aren't that great for you, whether it's loss of self-control or overindulging in things that aren't that great, but doing things that you don't feel that great about or you know aren't so positive for you. And it's really it's interesting because it's acting, they call it acting against your better judgment. How many of you have ever acted against your better judgment? 
and then justified it afterwards. That's part of it too, that's how you know you're in that kind of territory. So it's really interesting. So what's one, it's fascinating because they're the same categories, overdoing activities like I have, and then under, underdoing them, avoiding things like procrastination or putting things off, that kind of thing. They looked at those two categories as well. But then they're talking about this addictive stuff, and I'm, gonna, I'm using that word for a reason, because addiction actually means, in Latin, it's turning yourself over. It's giving yourself over to something. We're not always that considerate about what we're turning ourselves over to. And addiction means the repetitive behaviors that we're doing and doing things that we know aren't good for us, that are actually bad for us, but still have the desire to do it. Who here, besides me, can admit you've had the desire to do some things that aren't all that great for you? And how many of you have acted on that desire? Me as well. <laughs> that's part of what this is about. So one of the biggest things that gets in the way that's related to this ecclesia is we had this fundamental issue about how we weight consequences. Now, I think you can relate to this because when we overweight immediate consequences and don't think about long term, and it's so hard in the moment because what seems really like right now consequences, like the comfiness of this couch, that wonderful taste of that chocolate cake, that laughter of that talking kitty video. You know, those things seem like the most important thing in the moment when you're stuck by those. But other consequences are more distant. It's like your long-term career goals or losing weight or shifting something in, in your life over, over time. And when the, we have this immediate and long-term, we tend to weight the immediate, and this is evolutionary, we'll find out in a moment, we tend to weight the immediate much heavier than the long term, which is why we don't often get everything we could out of life. And it's really interesting, they call it time inconsistency or dynamic inconsistency, but see, see if you can relate to this. Here's what the study show, the research shows. If you're ordering food from, for next week, if you're ordering some groceries for next week, you put together a really great shopping list. It's got fruits and vegetables and lean meats. It's really healthy, it's wonderful. However, if you go shopping tonight, guess what you buy? Pizza, chips, ice cream, <laughs> totally in this study show this. But think about it, it, it's a little different now when you've got a lot of, um, <laughs> when you're streaming <laughs> movies and stuff. But remember when you would get your Netflix or other things and you get things waiting in the queue? What happens with movies, the research shows the same thing. Like if you're thinking about what you're gonna watch a week from now, you order really highbrow films. But if you're gonna watch something tonight, you're like, it's lowbrow stuff, it's just let me escape. Who can relate to what I'm talking about? Or another one, like you, you download books on your Nook or Kindle or your iPad or your whatever your reading device is, and you're thinking about things you want to have there for later. And you have biographies and histories and science texts and nonfiction and Nobel Prize winning literature. But then, and you take that and you get, your, get it all loaded up to go on the airplane, and you're like, yes, I'm virtuous, I have all this great stuff. And in your airport, what do you buy to read on the plane? Yeah, I mean, Twilight, <laughs> you, buy, you buy whatever you can grab to kind of distract yourself in the moment. So this is what human beings do, and it's really interesting because if you think about this, and, and this is, the studies show this over and over and over again, like the movie thing, 77% of people order the highbrow thing now and then watch the lowbrow thing tonight. So that means most of us are doing this. Not, not that I'm not making a moral judgment, I'm just trying to like wake us up to what our habits are like. Because if you think about it, if we really could design our lives from scratch, which we can at a level, if we were really gonna design our lives, say, okay, how do I want my life to be? How do I wanna live my days? How do I wanna spend my time? What is it that if I could really step back and be a, like an architect of my own life project and put the pieces in place and design that, I don't think I would do this, like, okay, all right, I gotta design my life. Okay, <coughs> I wanna watch five hours of TV a day and by the time I'm 60, I want to make sure I've spent at least nine years watching TV. And I want to have at least 12 hours of screen time um, every day. Oh, I have to, uh, and, um, and that includes my, those talking kitten videos. And then I want to make sure that my kids spend more time watching TV by the time they graduate than they've spent going to school. And uh, let's see. Oh, over shopping. I want to over shop and um, be kind of frenzied and max out my credit cards. And then, I, you know, and I want to spend six hours a week shopping and as opposed to 40 minutes a week with my kids. And then um, I want to have so much stuff that I have to run a storage container for stuff that I never use. And then let's see, oh, I keep designing, missing something. Oh, I got it. You know, I want to check my email 36 times an hour and then be distracted for 15 minutes afterwards trying to get my focus back after every time. And um, oh, what am I missing? Oh, oh, I know. I want to lower my IQ 10 points by that compulsive email 
email checking and multitasking so that I can dim it a little bit. And then I'm gonna over snack, over snack and eat a lot of empty calories and get all fat and bloated. And then, wait, that's not enough, I gotta get, oh. And then I wanna bite my nails to bloody pulp. And um, oh, and then any moment I have just a moment, just in between things or any possible downtime, I wanna grab my smartphone and I wanna even, when, and, and avoid people in the elevator walking on the street or even when I'm at dinner with them or, um, yeah, you know, yeah, uh-huh, and I want to I wanna check my Facebook page in the um, middle of the night, and then I want to check it right before I get up, you know, right as I'm getting up, before I go to the bathroom, and I'm still trying to hold it in, but i got to check my page, and uh, let's see, I want to make sure my kids sleep with a Blackberry instead of a teddy bear, and um, hmm, I want to make sure, let's see, that I don't have enough money for a vacation because I spent, well, $1,500 to $2,500 a year on gourmet coffee or at Starbucks, and I want to be distracted and anxious and a little numb and a little buzzed and a little forgetful and a little zoned out and look like this a lot and answer people, uh-huh, I hear you. You put the kitten in the dryer, uh-huh. It's great. I want to be like that rather than conscious and engaged and learning and growing and, and making the best of my life. So all this stuff are not the elements of a designer life, yet I know I'm exaggerating a tiny bit, but actually I'm not because everything I just told you is statistically normal. This is what people are doing. This is the norm in our world. We do watch five hours of television a day. We do watch nine years of television by the time we're 60, et cetera. All those things are statistically normal, but that's what's happening in our world. So that means that some of us <laughs> that are listening to this are, are as well we're caught by some of these things. And it's a, it, fascinating because there's two normals, if you look at it. There's normal of what everybody's doing, which is statistically normal. There's another normal of the normal operating range of machinery, and that's where machines work best. Those two normals are very different, and they are getting farther and farther and farther apart in our world. And it, it, because of this, because of what's normal, if somebody doesn't think you're weird, you are living really badly. Because what's statistically normal isn't in our normal operating range. It isn't where we function best. But that's kind of the norm of how we are in our world. And so how many of us say, oh, I just want to be normal? <laughs> it's not the best thing for us at this point. So, and I don't want you to get smug that this doesn't apply to you because that would be a way of being addiction. So I'm <laughs> going to check because we're all in this. This is part of our human nature and what's happening. So part of it, like, what's the big deal? I mean, I think we're making that point. I want to just go through some of the stats and the costs of mindlessness but to really understand how pervasive this is and how that, no matter how much mindful work we do, how this subtracts from that and keeps us from having the juice that every day could have. So all these kind of mindless activities that we so naturally gravitate to, they mute our consciousness they numb our feelings, so they reduce our emotional intelligence, they reduce our social emotional intelligence, which affects our decision making and our intimacy and our genuineness and our contact with ourselves and our ability to really relate and be creative. It steals time, tremendous amounts of time are eaten up in things that we're not that aware of. It, it, oh, the intimacy it diminishes intimacy because we're not there. We're not fully present with ourselves and another human being. There's a recent study of the universe of ethics. This was fascinating. If you're out with someone and you're trying to have a more meaningful conversation, you're sitting across a table or next to someone, if there's even a cell phone on a table near you, no one's even talking on it, just having that cell phone on the table as you're talking reduces intimacy. It lowers the trust and the sense of connection and the depth of the conversation. And they think it's because it's an indication that there's other people it kind of represents there's other people, you're not just with the person, or it could interrupt you in any second so you don't relax into the engagement. But that in itself, so the clues are there that are disrupting intimacy much less when we're actually on that, when we're at dinner with someone. Multitasking, and there's no such thing as multitasking, even though most of us still try it. We only pay attention to one thing at a time. And when we're flipping back and forth between things, we're not as good at things as we think we are. But what happens when we multitask, or com really compulsively check our email. The norm is 36 times an hour, by the way. That's the statistically normal. So what happens then is that we lower I I our IQ 10 points, which is the same as smoking a joint. I'm not recommending one or the other necessarily, but to kind of get what happens going on in our, 
noggin when this is going on. So what I say is it makes us numb and dumber rather than fat and fatter and you know, all the other implications that it has. And it's a huge issue for us. And it, it also costs a lot of money because if you think about it, just think about it, just a handful of t songs on iTunes and a book or so on your reading device or a gourmet coffee, you start to add things up over time, it really adds up. And I've done these trainings now with thousands of people over the last 20 years. The lowest amount we ever heard, people they do a financial accounting to kind of get the point for themselves, oh my gosh, it's so sobering. The lowest I've ever seen anybody was, was $3,000 for the year. And this person was pretty much a hermit. He actually did, had avoidance, <laughs> soft addictions. The norm is $30,000 a year of just kind of mindless spending. And if you want to spend that, that's totally fine. But usually it's just money that goes somewhere that we're not aware of, that's not going toward what it is that we really want. So part of the deal with this, let me kind of personalize this a bit, and then we're going to play with the neuroscience under it and find out why this is. Part of why I've studied human potential for all these years because there was something that I was looking for in my own life that I felt like there was something more there that I wasn't quite getting and I thought I was living life well but something was missing for me. See if you can relate to some of the things I'm talking about. I don't think your story should be mine but just see what you can see because I knew about achievement. I was always a I was a great student. I was valedictorian in my class and graduated summa cum laude and I was able to achieve and I was able to I rose to national prominence and two different careers by the time I was 28. So I knew how to do well. But at the same time I was having career success, I was overweight, overwrought, overstressed. There was a, I, even despite my success, I was really unhappy. I felt very empty. And I felt like I was sleepwalking through my life. I was doing a lot of things, but there was a numbness that I had. Something like life was out there, but I wasn't touching it. How many of you know what I'm talking about, that numb kind of sleepwalking feeling? How many of you are too numb right now to raise your hand? I got to have to look. But, and it was really, I just couldn't, I, I couldn't seem to break what, what that was. And I tried a lot of things. So I lost weight. I got a guy. I worked harder. I, uh, I meditated more. I prayed. And it kind of helped, but it didn't really unlock it. And then I partied a lot. Who are my partiers? I gotta make sure I've got a few of us. They usually sit in the back, so hey, good, all right, there's a few of us. So whatever it was, I kept trying to try new things to try to unlock this pattern. And it wasn't working, and it was, and I was just was getting so frustrated with my life because it looked, I thought it was a formula. You do well, you try hard, you have success, whatever. It didn't work. But what happened was that I realized through some of the work I was doing, I'd started a demonstration program, one of the first programs in the country to set up uh, programs for students with disabilities to be successful on campus. And I designed it and did research and designed this model program. So I had these students that had paraplegic, they were quadriplegic or blind or deaf or cerebral palsy, all kinds of things they were dealing with. And then I also had a program after that that I started for um, at a university for little children that had developmental disabilities in their families. And there was something that I noticed because these people were dealing with some really tough stuff. It wasn't easy to be doing what they were doing. And I realized that some of these, many of these students and many of these families with these tough situations they were dealing with were much happier than I was. And the contrast was very stark for me. And, when I, and it was upsetting to me because I, you know, I was happy that they were happy, but I couldn't understand what was going on, and I discovered something at that point. I had kind of an epiphany. It was a, didn't happen in one moment, but it kind of dawned on me that there was something really wrong with the formula that I was going about my life with, because I thought it was being good and being a good girl and working hard and being perfect and doing well and then having a perfect body, perfect situation, perfect circumstances, and that wasn't it. And it was very upsetting to me to realize because the people I was working with didn't have perfect circumstances or bodies or minds or whatever, yet there was a quality of life that I didn't have. And it really woke me up because I realized, wait a minute, it's not the formula that I thought it was. Because I would work hard and then try to have some recovery. I would work hard and then meditate. I work hard, reco who's my work hard recovery? How many of you know that? When you work hard and then collapse, work hard and collapse. That formula wasn't doing it for me. 
And I really realized, I finally woke up and I realized that it's very upsetting me because it was so, was so disturbing, that it really wasn't about that. It was about consciousness. It was about being mindful, not just my mindful practices. It was about being present in the moment, feeling what I was feeling, being able to express those feelings, share those, to be engaged fully in the moment. And, and there were and moment by moment, day-to-day -day kinds of experiences in this, it was about being fully alive you know, and being more real and being willing to make mistakes and be more vulnerable and allow, I was so cool before, you have no, you have never seen cool. I was so cool, and I was, oh my gosh, that's not it. It's about being warm, that that's much more important on the other side. And all those things started dawning on me, and that was what was being modeled by the people that I was working with. There was a genuineness in the moment, where they were present with whatever struggles that were going on, not everybody, but many of them. There was a, a, a realness, they were, it wasn't, it, it was so much different in quality and I had, I woke up and I realized that I had learned to master my eating by that point, but I was still addicted to thinking about food. I hadn't shifted my relationship inside. I hadn't mastered my mood addictions that had me feeling certain ways and then I'd compensate with other soft addictions. I, it wasn't about doing the right stuff and achieving and trying to be perfect and being good. It was not it. And it was only when I realized that some of these students and some of these families had a higher quality of life than I did that I really started to examine this. And it started me on this journey, this deeper commitment that's taken me to where I am today, where my life has a tremendously different quality than it had before. Because what I realized was that I was hungry, but not for all the snack food I was eating and not for all the activities I was buzzing through my life. I was hungry for something much more. I had deeper spiritual hungers. I had deep yearnings on my heart. There were things that I really cared about, much more so. And, it's, and I realized that I was misreading my yearning and numbing it with my soft addictions. And, and I didn't know to call them soft addictions at the time, but I realized that that was the case. And I started to turn toward what it is I really yearn for. We're going to learn a little bit more about that now, and I'll learn a little more of the neuroscience behind this. And that's when things started to shift. From the outside of my life, it looks pretty much the same, but the inside is totally different. And I've given up being perfect. My life is not perfect. <laughs> it's not what it's about. But it's a different kind of journey for me now. And I want to talk about this more. It's why I came up with the term soft addiction, because I was also working with a lot of high-achieving people who weren't making the progress in all the quality of their life that they really needed or wanted. And there, that, this is the same kind of thing I found in them. So why is it this way? Why is it so easy to fall? Why are the statistical norms the way they are? Why is it so easy to fall into all these habits and things that we do that deprive us of the quality of life and connection and sense and presence and consciousness? But there is an answer to it, and it's important for us to understand it because it's evolutionary. Because what happens is that evolution it should have weeded all this stuff out if it wasn't good for us, but it can't because what happens, do you love this? <laughs> it's a little parody, but what happens in evolution is of the, of the whole, our circuits that we have, we're always scanning for threats or scanning for opportunities. That's what kept us alive with early man. Like what, is there a saber-toothed tiger coming? Where's their food? Those circuits that are always scanning are what our survival is based on. But our soft addictions co-opt those very circuits that we can't get rid of because they're part of our being alive. So it co-opts those. So it hijacks these systems we have in our brain that condition us to look for food, for sex, to keep us away from predators. It's those same systems that it takes. So what happens is that we start seeing threats as highly salient and things that might be novel or give us a little uh, burst of uh, dopamine burst as something that's really salient for us. So, every, so everything gets translated into food, sex, circuits, or threats. So what happens, we start seeing, in our, we're really <laughs> wired for the salience. So what happens, we start seeing salience in chocolate and, uh, oh, let's see, hmm, yeah, for TV, what t-shirt contests start looking really interesting to us because it <laughs> captures that same, same circuit that's kept us alive and kept us procreating throughout life. So part of why this is so important for us to understand is that we're hardwired to pay attention to things that we think are salient. But we start seeing those immediate consequences as being more salient to us than something long term. So same thing, if we were like, in, 
ancient man or woman and there's a lion, we're going to immediately deal with that and stop building our hut. So the longer term thing gets pushed aside and that's pretty much how we're wired and we need to be aware of that. So what happens is that soft addictions capitalize on this ready-made programming for us. Now what we need to do, so our, the longer term evolution of us and our, our older brain and our limbic system is wired for the survival. That's what gets captured all the time. And I'm going to teach you about those, those neuroscience circuits in, those, in, a, in just a second. But what we need to do is use our frontal lobe, our prefrontal cortex, which is the more recently evolved part of our brain, which is the more highly developed part of our brain that can counteract that. That's a part of our brain that's interested in long term, in our dreams, in our yearnings, and possibilities, and what can happen, and who can we become, and what can the world be, and what we can, when we invent and discover, and all the things that create all the beautiful things you create here are from this part of our brain as it overrides some of those more early signals. And it's really important, they've done some, you may have heard of the famous marshmallow study. So Walter Mitchell did these studies on little four-year-olds, and they had this choice. They, had, they sat at these little tables, and they had this little marshmallow, and they said, look, you can eat the marshmallow right now, but if you can wait a little bit, you can have two marshmallows. Well, these four-year-olds, it was so, it's, you, there's videos all over of them, you can watch them. They're going crazy with these. They want to eat the marshmallow so badly. They're like licking it. They're grabbing the middle of it and trying to pretend they didn't eat it. You know, there are all kinds of ways. And a lot of the kids just gulp it, just gulp the one marshmallow. And other kids found delaying tactics. tactics. They sing, they sit on their hands, they like spin around in their chairs, they look away, they distract themselves, and wait and got the second marshmallow. This is a really important experience for you to understand because those children that waited for the two marshmallows, they studied them longitudinally. And by the time they were adolescents and even later, their, so, their social development was way beyond the other kids. They also, their SAT scores were 210 points on average higher. So that being able to delay gratification, to look at what a bigger reward later is really critical. It's a really important thing. And that's part of what we need to be able to be looking at. So, but what happens if we're easily distracted by the buzz in our pocket or a chime of an email or a smell of coffee, you know, whatever that is, we're easily distracted. All of a sudden, we forgot about the two marshmallows of life, and we've gobbled the one, and we've not gotten the two. So there's much better gains for us if we can sort this through. So what happens with this addictive process is anything that triggers the possibility of reward sends this amazing dopamine squirt into your brain. And I'm going to have you play with this in a moment. I'm going to tell you a little bit how this works. So, and anything that it doesn't, there's two different, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit, Kate. There's two different circuits in our brain and they, that really help us orient either to this immediate pleasure or this longer term kind of goal. And I'm gonna make this distinction so I want you to have the difference. Because what happens, this addictive process happens, we have these hedonic hotspots. So, and they actually, what happens is that there's one center in our brain that wants and craves, and there's another center of our brain that yearns, and it's different. And I'm gonna have you have an experience of this, and then I'm gonna unpack this a little bit for you. So what happens is that we, and many of the neuroscientists have found this, we have things that we want, but that has the kind of wanting is very different than liking something. These two centers, sometimes they call it the wanting center or the, um, the, the center of excitement in our brain or the seeking center. And it's the one that gets fueled by dopamine and is really intrigued by the possibility of reward. But it's not the reward itself. And this is when we get a little bit crazed. We're kind of, <laughs> you know, like, oh, 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 you get that little buzz kind of look. On the other hand, there's this, uh, it's, we're not wired for being sated. There's an, in that center, there's another center for being satisfied. And there are different neural circuits that do this. The dopamine center is our wanting. It's what gets us kind of motivated and high and gets us to start engaging. And the other center is fueled by opioids. And what are opioids? What does that sound like? Opium. And <laughs> what is opium known for? It's kind of that bliss, you know, that satisfied pause, that bliss. We need both things. But I'm going to give you an experience of this, and we're going to unpack this a little bit. I'd like for you to grab a buddy. So if you could turn towards somebody near you. Just find somebody. Or if you're at the end of an aisle, you don't have somebody, you could make, you could make a threesome if you want. But a twosomes are best. Does everybody have a buddy? 
And if you don't have one, maybe raise your hand and we can find somebody that isn't connected with somebody. Do we have a buddy? All right, would you pick an A and a B with your buddy? Pick an A and a B. A and a B. All right, great. Now, let me get you back. I'm going to raise my hand to get us back. Come on back. All right, A and B. Now, I want you to have an experience of the wanting center of your brain, the one that gets co-opted all the time, the minute you have a sense of a possible reward, or even thinking about something you might like or want in the future. And, and this, is, this is what gets triggered when you smell that brewing coffee, or hear a little chime, or see that sexy girl. This is all the stuff that gets triggered. So, so you're already getting there the minute I'm talking, you're smiling. You're, all right, so A and B, you're gonna talk at the same time right now. And what I want you to do, I want you to become want machines. Like how many of you have ever seen a two-year-old in a grocery store? What are they like? Everything. I mean, they want everything. Like, what are they grabbing? Everything. I mean, they want everything. They don't care. They just enjoy the sensation of wanting. I mean, they're grabbing tampons or rollades. They don't care what it is. They just like, they just want to want. So right now, I want the two of you to talk on top of one another, just naming as many things as you possibly can think of that you might want. You can say the same thing over again. I want her to shut up. I want this to be over with. I want, I want coffee. I want, to, I want to go do this. I want a hot new car. I want new clothes. I want, I want to discover blah, blah, blah. So, Two of you, I'll cut you off in a second, but just talk on top of one another. I want, I want, I want. I want, I want, I want. I want, I want, I want. I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. Okay, let me get you back. Let me get you back. Good, come on back. Now, just tell me, how do you feel right now? Where's your energy? What's it, what's it like? Chaotic, yeah, yeah. Can you feel, where's your energy? Here, 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 where is it? It's kind of more here, isn't it? What do your eyes look, what do your buddy's eyes look like? <laughs> This, <laughs> this is a neurotransmitter dopamine. When we get like, this is the part that gets co-opted all the time. You get like high, you get kind of buzzed, you're kind of like, you know, it's like a party. And, and you, how many of you even noticed you had a buddy? I mean, you kind of, but it's not even relevant. <laughs> and you're just in this, you're in your own zone when this is going on. You can't, and what happens, you can't, somebody don't even remember what you said or it, what you want. You get forgetful, you get buzzed, you get kind of high. So this is dopamine in our system. We need it because it's what helps us get motivated to take action, but there's no, you never get sated in that center. It's not designed for that. So I'm going to teach you about yearnings for a moment and then give you a little more to work with. Now go back to your buddy. Now and you picked who's A and who's B. Take a deep breath. <sighs> All right. Now close your eyes for a second because I'm going to give you the language of yearning and then we're going to play with that and see the difference. Just close your eyes and I'll, I'll say some of these universal yearnings of the human heart that are related to our satisfaction center. <sighs> I yearn to love and be loved. I yearn to matter. I yearn to make a difference. I yearn to be seen, to be heard, to touch and be touched. I yearn to fulfill my destiny. I yearn to create and to develop and to learn and to grow. I yearn to connect, to belong, to be part of something greater than myself. Think about those yearnings. See which ones feel true to you. Chances are all of them will. But there might be one or two that really touch your heart or feel most important to you. And take a deep breath. And now if you'd open your eyes in silence, just look at your buddy. And A, I want you to start. I just want you to say very just a brief thing with I yearn to and just fill in one thing. I yearn to be loved or connect or make a difference or matter, whatever feels true for you. I yearn to and just say that phrase. I yearn to. All right, just try to return to silence. Turn to silence. Take it in. And be you share one. I yearn to. All right, good. Thank you. Now come on back. Let me get you back. Now tell me what your energy feels like right now. Where do you feel this now? Calm. It's calmer. How many of you feel more calm, more grounded now? And it's not up here anymore. Where is it? Maybe more in your heart or down. It's more grounded. How do you feel about your buddy right now? How many of you can't believe you kind of like this person after saying that? <laughs> <laughs> kind of got to know them a little bit and something. How many of you realize you had a buddy in this part of the exercise? That happened. There's a person there. You're more there. There's something there. That's, the, that's more of the opioids and the oxytocin, the neurotransmitters that you're connecting with right now that are helping you have this sense of being sated, calmer. It's a satisfied pause. 
We need the balance of both of these circuits. But when they compete, the wanting always wins, not the satisfaction center, not the yearning center. So we have to really learn to focus on the yearning center so we can have the satisfaction, the consciousness, and the mindfulness we really need and want in our lives. And let me tie this back together with this whole thing about soft addictions. What is this about? What is that? See, what happens, our soft addictions are cravings. They're wanting. They're all fueled by those evolutionary centers of the dopamine squirts and that fix and that getting high and the things that have kept us alive all this time. And we need that in order to get motivated. But underneath every single soft addiction, that wanting, that craving, is a deeper yearning. And the soft addiction is trying to get our attention to tell us what it is that we really need. If you really, really want a big old bowl of ice cream, what do you think could possibly be the yearning underneath that? Sushi. <laughs> <laughs> we got to talk after, okay? <laughs> so if you're yearning for a big, you know, if you want a big bowl of ice cream, chances are you're yearning for comfort or even maybe, maybe just literally sweetness in your life. If you just have to check your email or your Facebook page compulsively right this second, what do you think the yearning might be underneath that? Connection, connection, belonging, being important, being part of something, knowing that you exist, all of that's what's going on. So every soft addiction is trying to tell you what it is that you really need. However, if we just keep indulging that with that automatic dopamine high, we never get the yearning met and it never brings it as present and conscious and fulfilling as we possibly can have in our lives. and doesn't bring us the results of all those things we talked about earlier in the talk. So what I want you to think about, I'm going to give you an assignment, and we can talk a little more, and that can, you can ask some questions, and we can be with this together. I want you to look at what is it that you do have cravings for? What do you want? What, what the wanting? Like that little guy, wanna, wanna, wanna. Nothing wrong with wanting. Many people need to have that activated. It helps us engage more fully in life. But what's the deeper yearning underneath that? What is it trying to tell you? Because then, if we really want to design our lives, unlike the design your life examples I gave you earlier, the normal design, if you really want to design your life, you design it to meet those yearnings. Where every moment you yearn to connect, to contribute, to matter, to love and be loved, to touch and be touched, to make a difference, to be present, to learn, to grow. Every single moment of your life can be guided by those deeper yearnings that bring a high quality to every single second of your life. And if you start designing your life to meet that, everything starts shifting. And you have the motivation to go after things in life, but you know how to get the satisfaction with that. And what happens then? You have more consciousness, more time, more money, more productivity, more intimacy, more meaning, more fulfillment, better stress responses, all the things. <laughs> your IQ is functioning the way it should be. Your thinking is clearer. Your critical thinking is better. All these tremendous results come from being mindful about our mindlessness and learning what our system is trying to tell us. So your assignment is to think about some of your yearnings and what can you put into your life more fully than you already are that would meet those. And also stay aware of what is it that you want, what do you crave, and to be willing to tell what it is you really yearn for underneath. And add more things to your life that meet those yearnings. And what happens when you do that, the more you meet those yearnings, your soft addictions start to melt away. You don't have to worry so much about <laughs> white knuckling through things because the need is getting met. So there's it, the same desire isn't there in the same way. So you'll still use all the beautiful things you use. You use your technology. You'll have beautiful food. You have all the things that you might be attracted to, but you use it differently in a way that fulfills you and makes you even a greater gift in the world. So those are that's the big stuff underneath what this yearning is. And in fact, we've done more research since this. It's going to be coming out in our new book. It was at the beginning of the year. And found out that yearning is actually the beginning of a whole cycle of, of what people go through that really transform their lives to live spectacular lives. Every hero you've ever had has based their life on yearning. And then there's several other things we found after that that we need to do, engage in things that really meet those yearnings. So we all have them. And I'd like to encourage you to go out and meet them some more because you'll be an even greater gift than you already are. And if we can support you in any way, I'd love to do that. And I'd love to hear any questions that you have in the few moments. And uh, also before you leave, if you'd like, we've got some uh, assists and supports for you, some downloadable products. And we have a training you can go to, complimentary, all kinds of things. But if you're interested, we have little cards for you. You can give us a business card before you leave today. 
and I'd love to, it's part of my yearning to make a bigger difference and to have more friends on the planet who are <laughs> living the way that we're talking about today. So I just want to thank you and thank you for having this time together and spending this time meeting yearnings. So thank you and thanks Rachel for making this happen. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. You know, now that we use consciousness things, like we set a timer, whenever we have a moment, we look inside, just, what am I feeling? I'm feeling anxious. I'm feeling whatever. That in itself, it's more of a presence. So let me know what you find. You know, and, and things that really help us with our stress. Under stress, we're so prone to soft addictions. Our, our executive centers of our brain shrivel under stress. Our habit formation brain gets bigger and blooms during that time. So what we really need are things that actually help us reduce stress, but it's not all the mindless stuff we do. It's talking with a friend, it's listening to music, it's reading something beautiful, it's uh, exercising, it's being in nature, it's all the things that actually reduce our stress and bring our brain functions back. So any, any other questions or thoughts people want to share? Yeah. Just relating to that, talk a bit more about the, the avoidance ones. Yeah. Yeah, if you look at avoidances have meaning behind, there's a yearning behind those as well. Oftentimes procrastination, there's a yearning for uh, comfort, a yearning for security, a yearning for protection. Oftentimes people, one of the reasons people procrastinate is that they know the minute they start working on something they're going to get driven, so they limit the amount of time that they're going to work on it. That's not everybody, but some people do that. So they're trying to protect themselves from getting lost in some way. So, for each person, the yearning can be a little different, but there is a deeper yearning. How many of you are procrastinators? I'm, I have been one and am one. And I really, it's really interesting because it's hard to see what's the positive, what's the yearning underneath that. But oftentimes it's a way that we're trying to take care of ourselves rather than adding things to our life that would calm us. Would, because procrastination, we're usually scared. We usually don't have the, we may not have the information we need. We may need more help. It may feel like a big cliff we've got to get over. And we need, we need more help. We need more resources. We need more strategy. And it's a clue for us to prepare and take care of ourselves rather than just to push it away. Does, does that work for you? It's good, thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, I was wondering, what was it about the people you learned from, the people who were taking care of yeah. the disabled, that enabled them to avoid the addiction, not have the time? You know, it's interesting because I'm not sure exactly how to describe the what their motivation was or whatever, but they were so there was something about they were so present in the moment, doing what they could to learn and grow and take advantage of the situations that they had that it wasn't about some, they couldn't be under the illusion that someday it'll all be okay. Someday it'll all be perfect. Someday it'll all, so they weren't, so there was a, a, a being present and a genuineness. They couldn't hide their mistakes. You know, it was right, like one guy I worked with, he was deaf and he had cerebral palsy. And he came to me one day and he was, he just, he was laughing. I said, what are you laughing about? And he said, well, I was just at the, he was signing, I was just in the cafeteria and I was eating my lunch. And, you know, I got CP, so the food's flying all over the place and it's all over me. And I said, what's so funny about that? He said, all the kids were laughing. I said, what's so funny about that? And he said, I can't hear them. Ha, 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 ha. like, so wow, there was just this, I'm not saying that everybody was like that, but there was this just dealing with what life had in the moment vulnerably present with feelings, with the upset, the frustration, the anger, the joy of any small success that was an experience I wasn't having. And the families that were dealing with these little kids with these disabilities, the ones that went through the tough work of mourning the loss of the child they thought they were going to have so they could love the one they had, there was an appreciation and acceptance of what was, what is, that created a lot more satisfaction and happiness in those families even after the so-called tragedy than before. So this is facing reality and being genuine in the moment. There was a quality I hadn't been having in my own life. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, all of you. Thank you. Thanks.